being recorded. There we go. All right. So let's look at one more anatomy slide, and then we'll move on to the actual kind of flexor tendon rehabilitation piece. So this is a great photo from Newman for numerous reasons. I want to show you a couple cool things. He always does really cool things. So if you haven't picked up on all the cool stuff he does, um, I want you to look first at these black lines. Those are moment arms. So what you're seeing is the distance from the tendon to the joint axis. So here it is at the DIP with the terminal tendon of the extensor mechanism. Here it is at the PIP to the central slip of the extensor mechanism. And here it is at the MP. And what this moment arm is showing you is basically the moment arm of the intrinsic muscle. These intrinsic muscles then, if you look at this, lie volar to the MP joint and so therefore create MP flexion. Then they insert into the mechanism and lie dorsal to the PIP and DIP. So they produce PIP and DIP extension. So this is actually a really cool slide because it's showing you, using moment arms and volar dorsal organization, how those intrinsic muscles can produce both MP flexion and PIP and DIP extension. All right, so let's move into looking at actual flexor tendon and going into the background of this diagnosis. And so you have a patient, basically comes into you, they have a lacerated flexor tendon, and they've gone to surgery. We'll talk about timing, and actually we did a study on timing to look at if there was any um, implications if a patient, say, um, had a laceration one week and didn't have their tendon repaired for four weeks, versus those people that got into surgery as soon as possible. And as you can probably guess, um, basically, the longer the time that elapses between injury and surgery, the worse the outcome will be. You can add another parameter onto that. And so if there's more time that elapses between injury and surgery and then surgery and therapy so that person doesn't show up to you for another two weeks, your outcomes get progressively worse. So knowing the number of days between injury and surgery or between injury and start of therapy, or between surgery and start of therapy will really help you. The question always about how to treat patients with a flexor tendon repair is the question of how much should we move them and how soon should we move them. So really one of the fundamental ideas of flexor tendon rehab is if we move them too much, we will actually create a rupture of the tendon. So those ends will just simply pull apart. However, if we don't glide the tendon enough, it will get stuck down, and basically we call those adhesions or scar tissue. And so you have to find this really nice balance between too much motion and not enough motion. And so truly the question is when or why, when and how should we begin and progress motion after tendon repair? And so think about the tendon that's been cut, surgeon puts it back together. How are we going to move forward and treat these patients? So tons of studies. Um, these go all the way back to the 1940s and earlier. Um, but basically, in the very early phases, the idea was, and if you look at this picture up at the top, what you should be hopefully seeing that I've shown you before, this is the sheath, that blue bubble around the outside of the tendon, and this is the tendon itself. And what you're seeing here is the concept from the 1940s that the tendon had to scar to the sheath in order to heal. What happened in the 1970s was this really smart guy named Dr. Lundberg decided to take a tendon from a, from a rabbit, cut the ends, and put it in the joint capsule of the rabbit's knee. Now, how you come up with research like that, I have no idea. But basically, he let this tendon float around in the synovial joint to see what would happen. And basically, what he found is that the tendon healed itself. So the tendon ends healed without getting stuck to anything in the capsule. So this made Dr. Graham Lundberg um, in the 1970s start to ask the question, why are we waiting for these tendons to scar to the surrounding structures? And basically that initiated a lot of research with Dr. Gelbrin and his colleagues at Harvard and Mass General and then Hitchcock, Light, and Bunch, all of whom looked at the idea that if we start gliding the tendon within that sheath sooner, we actually will have a stronger tendon that will glide more, more easily and less adhesions, and so therefore, for us as therapists, that means better function, um, because our patients can actually glide that tendon to produce flexion. So thinking about that, the question would be, okay, so if I've got to find a balance, 
I don't want to rupture the tendon, but I don't want it to get stuck. When should I start? And so as a therapist, this for us is incredibly important information. So this has been studied a lot, mostly in the great state of Minnesota um, at the Mayo Clinic, the idea of work of flexion. So how hard does the musculotendinous unit have to work to create flexion? And so this is influenced by both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So the first thing is surface friction. We all know what friction is. You know, it's actually friction between two structures that's going to decrease gliding. And so basically, if the tendon is catching on anything or is adhered to anything, I'm going to have more friction at the surface. How bulky the tendon is, how much, you know, how many strands go through the repair site or how thick the tendon is. If the tendon has adhesions or is scarred, how swollen the digit is, so the mass of the digit, any stiffness at the joints, which hopefully we have tried to counteract as therapists, any soft tissue resistance, and probably one of the most important things we're going to talk about tonight is the resistance of those antagonists. So are the extensors creating resistance on the flexors? So basically, a ton of studies were done at the Mayo Clinic, and what they found was that gliding, and when they're looking at the resistance to tendon gliding, which is create, let, letting that tendon glide through the synovial sheath to create flexion, um, and how hard the tendon has to work to create flexion, what they found was it was just decreased on day five, but increased on day seven. And at day seven, there was a lot of adhesion and a lot of stiffness in the joint. Um, but they also found that day one had greater resistance than day five. And so this group of authors from the Mayo Clinic ac actually suggests that the least amount of work of flexion, the least amount of gliding resistance, is actually day five. So for us as therapists, that means that day five is probably the best day for us to start rehab for these clients based on all the structures surrounding the tendon. There's a bunch of studies done in the Middle East, or Middle East, I'm sorry, in Asia, Southeast Asia, by Dr. Cow and his colleagues in the late 2000s. Um, and basically, they looked at swelling. And so a lot of therapists that I talk to and a lot of therapists that I've worked with actually say, well, if the finger's swollen, we don't start motion. And actually, these studies disagree with that idea. And what they basically found in these studies was that, yes, if your edema is severe and the more edema that you have, the more gliding resistance there will be. However, if you move the finger gently, you can actually reduce that gliding resistance. They also found was that there, were no, there was no significant difference in gliding forces between days three and nine. They agreed that day four or five were good, uh, seven and nine is acceptable, um, but they didn't have the same differences as the previous studies that I told you about. I think the most important part about these studies about edema is that when we see a patient and see swelling, we should think about things that we as therapists can actually modulate or change. One is the range of motion. And so if you do that thing again that I told you where you make a fist, that's a full fist. But every patient you see doesn't have to make a full fist. What if you had them make a partial fist? What if you made them, had them make half a fist or even 10 degrees at each joint? That would be a better idea in the face of edema than actually trying to make a complete fist. Frequency. Um, I have having all my MOT students look at the literature from the American College of Sports Medicine to ask the question about how often our patients should be exercising. There's no good answer in the literature for us as hand therapists right now in terms of how often people should be exercising. But flexor tendon is always 10 times an hour every hour you're awake. The question is why? And so if you have somebody with really severe swelling, the answer would be maybe they could do less exercise. So what about once every three hours or once every four hours rather than every single hour? Finally is speed. Um, one of my favorite therapy tricks that you hear a lot about these days is using a patient's cell phone. And so as we will see in Nicaragua and as I see all over the world, people of very little means uh, are walking around with cell phones that actually have video capabilities. So if I take my client's cell phone and ask them if I can borrow it to create a video home program, um, I actually can have them doing the exercises. I video those exercises on their own telephone at the speed in which I want them to perform the exercises. That way, they can actually follow their own three-dimensional home program and do the exercises exactly how I want them to at the ex exact speed that I want them to. Um, and that allows us a different opportunity in terms of people not doing things too quickly. So 
the last study that I'll talk to you about, about edema, is actually very interesting because if you ask me what I take to Nicaragua and Guatemala, what's the first thing I throw in my bag? It's Coban. Um, I always, I think you can do a thousand things with Coban, more than edema, but you can get a lot of things done, especially for joint stiffness. However, um, I don't, this name I'll, I'll butcher, but Bonacore et al. in 2012 actually looked at edema and self-adherent wrap, otherwise known as Coban. They said without the wrap, we already have a lot more work of flexion happening. And so without the wrap, people with moderate swelling have a 23% increase of work in flexion, and with severe edema, a 71% increase of work of flexion. Those are really high numbers to begin with. When they added the wrap in the study, there was a significant increase in work of flexion in all the digits in all cases. And so basically what that's saying is it's bad enough already. If we add Coban, we are just making it all that much worse. And the more resistance the patient has to flex against, the more likely they are to rupture. And so basically this study suggests that our patients should not be doing exercise with Coban on, especially those patients with flexor tendon uh, repairs, because we actually put them at a higher rate, or higher risk, excuse me, for rupture. So all those studies, all that information, all that background, what, what do we take away from that as therapists? What's important for us to think about? Um, really thinking about starting motion for patients with tendon repairs at day four or five. Um, day seven could be the least favorable, but there's conflicting evidence to, to kind of speak to that. The idea that moderate to maximal edema creates increased resistance on the healing tendon. And so we can, as therapists, actually decrease range of motion. We can decrease frequency of exercise. And we can ask our patients to create very slow, gentle tendon glide with slow and controlled motion. Um, and that Cobian and all of our favorite wraps really need to be taken off before we have our patients participate in any type of exercise. So the next section is all about motion and all about all the things you've been thinking about in this chapter and, and how we move fingers and how tendons and muscles actually create motion within digits. And so we'll walk through all these pieces of motion now. So the hard part always about um, therapy is the idea of the protocol. And you will find by the end of this conversation that I am not very protocol driven because we have so many great things to think about that protocols hopefully will be something that you can move past and start to use really great clinical reasoning. But a protocol really puts us in a chicken and the egg phenomenon. And so chicken and the egg being, does your splint, or I'm supposed to be calling it an orthosis, but does your splint actually dictate the exercise you can do? Or does the exercise you want to do help you choose the splint you would prefer to make. And most therapists I talk to would tell me it's the former, that they are given a protocol by a surgeon, you'll use this protocol, and therefore they can only do the exercises that fit into that protocol or that splint. As opposed to, this is the exercise that I know will be most beneficial for tendon gliding, and I'd like to make this splint that will help facilitate that. And so it's really a chicken and egg question. So the question being, which is the kind of driving factor for rehabilitation? So my argument's going to be based on what are the muscles that we're actually trying to move? What are we actually trying to glide? What motion are we actually trying to produce? So here's this fun picture um, from your um, worksheet, from the wrist worksheet. And the purpose of this picture was truly, let's see if I go here, for us to look at those moment arms and mechanical advantages, physiologic cross-sectional areas, of the muscles that can produce wrist flexion. So we are on the volar or palmar side of the wrist, and there are three factors you look at to see which muscles can optimally produce the most force towards wrist flexion, and you'll understand why I'm talking about wrist flexion in a few minutes. So the things that I look for are, number one, the physiologic cross-sectional area. So if you look at flexor digitorum superficialis, you see a big pink box. That's a big physiologic cross-sectional area. If you look at flexor carpi ulnaris, it is smaller. So you have a smaller physiologic cross-sectional area. And if you look at something like extensor pollicis longus, your black dot is almost bigger than your pink box. So it doesn't really have a lot of cross-sectional area at all. So that has to do with muscle fibers and how many muscle fibers comprise the muscle itself. So now let's move back up to the top. The first thing I look at is the size of the pink box or the physiologic cross-sectional area. Second thing I look at is the distance between the black dot and the axis. So here we are, flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor carpi radialis have the longest moment arms 
for wrist flexion. Flexor borealis has a longer moment arm, but a much smaller pink box, right? So therefore, flexor digitorum superficialis is going to be a much stronger force producer, or can produce much stronger forces towards wrist flexion. The final thing we look at is which of all these muscles is the most central. So we're looking then at this axis here, and what we see is that flexor digitorum superficialis is also closer to this axis. And so basically, the concept here is that our digital flexors are pretty darn good wrist flexors. And that should make us a little bit nervous, because we certainly don't want a, a muscle that's crossing the wrist to flex the digits to be working at the wrist and the digits at the same time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this, this concept, this whole picture, is a really important concept in the idea that just because the name flexor carpi radialis is on the muscle doesn't mean that it is the best wrist flexor. And so that's a really important concept to keep in mind. So two concepts go along with this. And it's best to do this while you're sitting in front of your computer and using kind of active motion. And so active insufficiency is the idea that a muscle cannot produce or maintain force at the extremes of joint motion. Or in other words, if it crosses multiple joints, it can't work optimally at all those joints at the same time. So if you make a fist and try to create wrist flexion, what you'll find is that it's really hard to keep a nice tight fist because those digit flexors are trying to work at every digit or every joint they cross simultaneously. Now if you bring that fist towards a neutral wrist, you'll find yourself better able to make a strong fist. And if you move towards extension, even better, stronger fist. So if your wrist is in flexion, you have a less, it's less optimal for creating dig, um, wrist flexion and digit flexion at the same time. And so the best picture I have for this, and the one thing I like to say is, basically you're doing it wrong. So you're trying to do too much all at the same time, um, and you're never going to get optimal force production at all those joints simultaneously. So that only doesn't have to do, though, with the active side of things. And so when we're thinking about the digit flexors and we make that fist with the wrist inflection, we've got another problem on our hands, and that's the problem of passive insufficiency. And so basically, this is where our antagonists come into play. So when I am trying to create a fist with wrist flexion, those extensors don't want to cross all those joints at the same time. Basically, you feel that stretching feeling probably across your wrist and over your MP joints, and that's your long extensors and your extensor mechanism saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to stretch that far. And so now not only are the active side of the muscles not wanting to do that many things at the same time, the passive components, that's your tendons, that's your connective tissue structures, that's all your non-contractile components of the muscle, they also are not going to allow that much motion all at the same time. And so if you look at this picture, basically you see the high passive tension, and that's kind of a cross-section, um, and this is from the Savage article that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So this article by Savage is really cool, and so if you look up in the right-hand corner, what he's showing you is that when everything is flexed, you put really high passive tension in the extensors. But when you extend the wrist, you actually decrease that passive tension. And so I had you guys do that question for one of your, um, for one of the wrist lecture questions, which was, if the wrist is in an extended position, that's going to maximize grip force or digital flexion. That's that synergistic kind of balance point that you have. And so Savage studied this in 1988, and he basically put a name on this. He called it minimal active tension. He's looking at flexor tendons, but instead of looking at the flexor tendons, he's actually measuring the extensors and saying that the amount of tension in the extensors is going to limit the amount of flexion that we are capable of producing. And so he found that wrist extension with MP flexion actually produced less tension in the extensors and made it easier to create flexion. And so this is the picture from his study of the four splints that he used. I'm not sure you call these splints, but this is what he used. And basically, if you look at this picture, take a second and look at the pictures considering passive tension in the extensors, which splint would create the least amount of passive tension? And hopefully the answer you're coming up with is A, because when you put that wrist in an extended position, you decrease the tension on the extensors, which makes flexion 
easier to perform. If we look at B, C, or D, those are the positions that have historically been put, patients have been put in after flexor tendon repair, and that's to protect the tendon or put it in a shortened position. But the problem comes up when therapists then try to leave the hand in this position and create motion, which we know we need motion to glide tendons, but if you leave them in one of these positions, you actually are going to put more tension on the tendon than if you put the wrist in extension. So Roz Evans, the queen of hand therapy, um, in 1993 built on this concept. So a lot of people actually think that MAMTT, or Minimal Active Muscle Tendon Tension, is Roz's own idea, but it actually was published by Savage before it was published by Roz. And so basically, Minimal Active Muscle Tendon Tension, these, um, uh, sorry, positions right here, 45 of wrist extension, 83 of MP flexion, 75 of PIP, 40 of DIP, are what Roz and Evans, and Evans was basically, a, he's a statistician, he's a mathematician, um, they identified these specific parameters as those that will produce the least amount of tension on the flexors, um, so while you're trying to create digital flexion. Um, the interesting thing about this is 45 degrees seems like a lot of wrist extension, and that actually is the number. Um, I always double check that because people always go, that there's no way, it's way too much. It actually is the number um, that decreases the forces on the flexor tendons. So what about synergistic motion? You guys looked at that for your assignment and thought about why the wrist muscles or the wrist extensors, extensors fire during digital flexion. And so synergistic motion, here it is from your book, from Newman basically means that when the wrist, or excuse me, when the digit flexors fire, and that's what Newman puts in red here for you, the wrist extensors fire simultaneously, and the majority of you got this right. Those wrist extensors fire to offset the want of that muscle to create wrist flexion. So they basically are synergists to digit flexion. Next semester, we'll talk a lot about in your, um, second class, which is Advanced Evidence-Based Practice for the Upper Extremity. Um, I'm sure that LET will be a hot topic, lateral elbow tendinopathy, uh, and really looking at um, what we have in our arsenal, um, what's evidence-based at this point um, to counteract or counterbalance um, that diagnosis. The idea here, though, is that when these wrist extensors fire all the time, we certainly could overwork them. So every time we create digit flexion, we're firing our wrist extensors to act as synergists. But what does synergistic motion actually do? It negates that insufficiency, so it creates a better balance point. So wrist extensors are synergist to digit flexion, and vice versa, wrist flexors are synergist to digit extension. It helps facilitate the length tension relationship, and most importantly for us, it maximizes force production. And it makes it easier, actually, for the digit flexors to create digital flexion. So synergistic motion has been studied a ton. There's a bunch of articles on it, most of which are almost 30 years old at this point, and so it's not a new idea. Um, so basically, um, Cooney et al., these guys are also out of Mayo, they compared, and if you look on the right, what you see is uh, on the top is Kleiner, the Kleiner protocol, I'll show you that in a few minutes. The middle is the Brook Army Hospital modification, and the bottom is synergistic motion. And when they looked at these three and compared them, they actually found that synergistic motion demonstrated the highest amount of FDS, FDP, and differential excursion, which just means glide. So basically, with that synergistic motion, we had the highest amount of gliding occurring in those flexor tendons. Libra et al., these guys are all part of that group from Harvard. Um, basically, what they found is that when we put the wrist in um, wrist extension, put the wrist in extension and create synergistic motion, we have very low forces that occur on the flexor tendon and very high excursion or a lot of gliding that's going on. And so this study also reinforced the idea um, that with wrist extension, we get a lot of good glide. And if you look at this picture, there's actually a really cool visual from their article. So this is how much load is on the tendon. So newtons is a force parameter. And so basically, if you look at four digits in extension, so if you extend your finger, that's put a, that puts a lot of force on the flexor tendons because it's really pulling them completely distally. What you see over here on the very right is that synergistic motion is much lower, almost as low as only flexing one finger. Comparatively speaking, we want tendons to move a lot or glide a lot, and synergistic motion is almost as much gliding as you get when you glide those four fingers towards extension or really distally glide the flexor tendons. And so all of these articles are basically showing you that this synergistic idea 
really has a lot of support in the literature. Um, this is the Zhao group. This, these guys are from the Mayo Clinic. And basically what they said is what, that when we flex the digits and extend the wrist, we actually, again, can really get some nice glide of those tendons. And so wrist motion in all these studies was really found or reinforced as really contributing to great finger flexion. And so this all builds on that synergistic motion principle that you read in your book. So what are our, again, takeaway points um, for therapy? If I synergistically move, and so if you do that for a second, what you're doing is extending your wrist and flexing your digits at the same time, and then the opposite, which is wrist flexion with digit extension. So it's that really fluid, normal feeling, um, wrist extension with digit flexion, wrist flexion with digit extension. What does this do? It decreases the passive tension in your extensors which therefore decreases the active tension that your flexors have to produce to overcome that passive tension. It gives us really nice excursion, especially in a proximal direction. And so what we're getting here is all really great things that we really want to happen to have optimal flexor tendon motion. And so Zhao et al. is one of my favorite quotes. Um, the ideal therapy would use the smallest force to achieve the largest excursion. What happens then with all those old, old protocols when we actually have the wrist in flexion and then try to flex the digits? We are increasing the passive tension on the extensor side, which therefore increases the active tension on the flexor side. And so if you ask your patient to perform place and hold or make a fist when the wrist is flexed, you actually are demanding more force, creating more force, creating more risk than when the wrist is extended. And all of these articles support that idea that synergistic motion or wrist extension is a better position for digital flexion. All right, so let's look at all these protocols. So tendon is cut, patient comes to the clinic. What are some things that we can typically do with them? So this is old school. This is probably the most basic 1975 Duran and Hauser protocol. But I think what's really interesting are the pictures. And this is what we call passive protective extension. So what you see first is the splint. And the splint is in, a, this is a typical dorsal block. And if you've stayed with me for the past 15 minutes, you probably think, well, wow, if that wrist is in that position, I probably don't want to create digit flexion right now because it would put a lot of force on those flexor tendons. Why did they put it in this position? Like I already said, that's a safe position in terms of between exercise to make sure that that tendon is kind of in a short and protected position. But it's not a great position for during exercise. And so that's that chicken and the egg question of, is the splint I use to protect the same splint that I want to use for my patient to exercise in? The cool thing, though, about this study and this idea are these exercises. And so this is called passive protected extension. And if you look at A to B, what I want you to look at is A to B, your MP joint is flexed, your PIP is flexed, and your DIP is being moved from flexion to extension. So try that on yourself. Hold your PIP in flexion, your MP in flexion, and just try to mobilize that DIP joint into flexion and extension. When you do that, you're moving from A to B. And if you look at these tiny little bubbles in here, it's showing you what's happening. Basically, what you see here, that black line is where the tendons were repaired. What you see here is that one black line has moved away from the other black line. That is the FDP tendon moving distal when you create DIP extension. Now, what happens when you move the PIP to extension? And so now let's do the same exercise as the PIP. So keep the MP flexed and move from flexion to extension. And now what's happening is that both the tendons are moving distally. So think about distal glide. I'm moving the tendon towards extension. I'm moving the flexor tendons distally. Almost everything we think about when we think about flexors is creating flexion, not creating extension, and not creating distal glide. And so the nice thing about these exercises is they're one of the only early safe exercises that actually create a little bit of distal glide for the tendon. And any of you out there that, um, um, I, I see two questions. I'm going to go back to those in a second. Um, any of you out there that think about distal gliding, I want you to think about 
you can't really create extension in the early phase. So this is nice and early that we can just create small amounts of distal glide. So Steph is asking, this is an awesome question, Stephanie, and we're going to get to this in a couple minutes, actually. What about wrist neutral for mobilization? I love wrist neutral. And actually, if wrist extension is great, wrist neutral is good, wrist flexion is not so good. And so it's almost like a three bears phenomenon. So I'm loving wrist neutral as better than wrist flexion um, as a better position, as a safer position. And actually, we're going to look at some um, study, look at some protocols in a couple minutes that actually do have the wrist in a neutral to extended position. Um, Sandeep says, between C and D, are we keeping the DIP in flexion while extending the PIP? I, I would, I don't think you're trying to do anything with it. I think you're just leaving it relaxed. So you are going to glide both tendons, but you're not trying to glide them both or push them both real hard simultaneously. So I would just keep that DIP relaxed. And so basically, the cool part here is that we are getting a little bit of distal glide. And so um, wrist neutral for mobilization stuff is good. And wrist neutral, even for exercise, we could argue that it has better benefit than the wrist flex position. And yet, from day five, you are actually looking at trying to put patients into these positions at day five because anytime they're in wrist flexion and you're creating flexion, and we'll talk about that in just a second, you're putting that tendon at risk for rupture if you put more force on it. So this is, an old, this is the old protocol, and here's Kleiner. So this is comparable. What I want you to look at, and again, when I thought about when to tell you guys this stuff, I thought about these kind of things. And so let's look at this. So basically, Kleiner protocol, you create traction between the finger and the splint. This traction right here is actually taking the place of your flexor tendon. So when, I, when the patient extends their finger, then that rubber band will pull them back to flexion. Their flexor tendon, flexor muscle, has almost no activity, whereas during extension, the extensors have lots of activity and flexors have, again, very little activity. This protocol was considered to be this great idea. People could move their fingers and get things going. What's the problem? Problem is the closed pack position. So if you remember from early on, the closed pack position of the MP, PIP, and DIP, the optimal position for mobilization of the PIP and DIP are extension. When I put the digit in a flex position, and in this case, if I were to leave my client in this position, between exercises, the likelihood of a flexion contracture is out the roof. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now I'm really, really worried if this patient stays in this position that they're actually going to get stuck in this position. So if anybody is still getting referrals for a client protocol, my suggestion is always put the traction on for exercise and then take the traction off between exercise. This protocol has basically become obsolete. Um, my hope is that most doctors are reading enough literature that they are no longer using the Kleinert protocol. Um, it's a scary idea to keep the finger in that flex position for too long. So in the 1990s, uh, this is where things started to get interesting. So the Indiana protocol came out in the 1990s, in 1993, and basically included this really cool hinged dorsal blocking splint. This splint is hard to make, but the patient can be in a flex position between exercises. They take out this block between the exercises, and then they can actually put the wrist in an extended position to do their exercises. So great opportunity here, because we can get the wrist in that extended position that will decrease the forces on the flexor tendon, um, but really tricky splint to make. This protocol is based on the idea of place and hold. And the idea of place and hold, so what I want you to do with me um, is make a flex your wrist and take your opposite hand and passively place your digits in flexion. So you're flexing your wrist and you're placing your digits in flexion. So that's just passive. So we're not creating forces with passive motion. Now hold your fingers there in flexion and extend your wrist. So now I have an extended wrist, but I'm still holding my fingers. And now I would ask my patients to gently hold this position for five seconds. So one, two, three, four, five. And then they flex their wrists and extend their fingers. And that's what we call place and hold. So placing the digits in flexion, extending the wrist, 
and then asking them to hold the position. The whole Indiana protocol was built on the idea that place and hold was a safer starting point than active flexion. And so the idea there is with the wrist and extension and with a place and hold, I've decreased the forces at the wrist, but I also am only doing a place and hold, not a full active flexion. So I'm not achieving as much force. Um, yes. We, um, we're on, are you on the client? Oh, Steph, you're on the client side. So Stephanie's asking the question, um, so when, that the flexors would actually activate with active extension. And I think, Stephanie, that was the whole concept that these guys were working off of was that same concept that you have that probably a lot of people have was we can't create active extension because something's going to be happening in the flexor musculature. And actually, in their EMG studies, they found nothing. So it is actually an interesting question of, can the agonist fire without any firing from the antagonist? Um, I think it is confusing, but it is an interesting question. But yeah, I can actually, um, Steph, if you're interested, I have this original article that you could look at um, if you're interested in actually kind of seeing what the um, way that they did that research and how they looked at it. So Indiana, we talked about. So these are the new protocols. So this is 2007. So this is the brand new stuff. And so these are kind of what you're seeing at the very, very current meeting which I would say that probably less than 10% of therapists in the U.S. are actually using, just to kind of put this into perspective for everybody. So basically, um, Jin Botang is a, an international flexor tendon genius, um, and he is considered to kind of have the newest, latest, and greatest ideas. Now, the thing that I find the most interesting about Jin Botang is that if you look at, on the left-hand side, he says that for the first 2.5 weeks, you're going to put the wrist in flexion. Jin Botang actually allows his clients to create active digital flexion. Um, and his concept is that they can create, um, they do it basically in thirds. And so he's going to go to the first third, the second third, and then the third third of digital flexion. So in this first two and a half weeks with the wrist flex, he's allowing clients to kind of create active motion to the first third of their range. I don't like the wrist flex position, so this protocol makes me a little bit nervous. It's not one that I would choose to use, but I want you to notice that after two and a half weeks, then he's putting the patients into a wrist extended position to move forward. Um, I think this protocol kind of got people into gear to thinking about moving the wrist into a static extended position and really kicked off these protocols. Now, this is current stuff, and so Coates et al. and Clancy and Mass, these guys are in Chicago, so they're at the University of Chicago, so we are seeing this pretty close to Wisconsin. Uh, Dom Alon, he's the one that gives all the really cool wide awake flexor tendon talks. Um, I'm actually going to um, invite him to give us a guest lecture next semester, because um, he does all sorts of really cool things that you guys would, it would like blow you away. Um, basically, he's doing tendon repairs, trigger fingers, all sorts of open procedures in his clinic um, space in a sterile field while patients are wide awake. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. And Steph and um, Courtney were both at the ASHT meeting and got to hear him speak. He's really cool. But basically, all three of these studies have built on this idea by Jin Botang. But all of these studies say, go ahead and put this wrist in an extended position right away. Dr. Lalonde would tell you that he wants you to let people go to about mid-range. Um, so he is going to have the patient do about half active range. So no more place and hold. He thinks place and hold is stupid. He actually thinks that it's too difficult for patients to do. Clancy and Mass and the guys from the University of Chicago, they actually let the patient work through their available range. So depending on their edema, depending on their joint stiffness and their reflection, he asks patients to go as far as feels comfortable to them. Um, and so what we're seeing now is the very most recent protocols are actually starting with the wrist in an extended position, which is really well matched to all the literature that's been out there for almost 30 years now. So this should be interesting to watch to see what happens. Probably the most interesting protocol that's on the books right now is this Manchester short split. And this is out of England, Fiona Peck, really smart gal. Um, she's basically saying, okay, so if in these studies you're saying that I can produce 45 of degrees of wrist extension and that's the best thing I can do, well, then let's just get rid of the wrist and the splint altogether. Um, and so she actually, in 2014, published this study um, in the European Hand Journal that has a splint that has no wrist in it at all. And so a lot of people get real nervous about this because they think, wow, I've got to protect the, the wrist during between exercises. So while I want to move the wrist during exercise, I've got to protect it 
between exercises. And so this is really, really cool. And the really most awesome thing that Fiona did was she actually did a study. So she didn't just say, here's my great idea. She said, and here's the results of my great idea. And so it's really hard to find outcome studies. So she compared 62 of her own clients that had forearm-based splints um, with 40 clients that had Manchester short splints. This is a historical control study. So basically, um, the 62 were the group before the 40 shorts. And so um, basically, she compared them historically to one another. Fiona's most interesting idea is that when you make a fist, and so um, I want you to try this, and probably from the literature you read this week about intrinsics, you'll have questions about this, or maybe you won't. Her idea is a lot of people will start making a fist by the MP joint. So do that for a second. So think to yourself, okay, where does my digital flexion start? Newman has some ideas about where digital flexion starts. But for me, it's kind of that, in my head, where does it start? Do I pull the MPs down first and then curl my digits in? Or do I start at the DIP and PIP and then curl towards the MP? Fiona's saying, well, my goodness, we're talking about long flexors, so we should be starting distally. So she actually tells the patients to activate the DIP first, followed by the PIP, followed by the MP, which is really interesting. But also what's interesting then is her results. So the first thing is she has less flexion contractions at the PIP at both 6 and 12 weeks. She does put a lot of focus into creating extension in those first couple weeks as well. Second bullet I think is most important. She's initiating motion at the DIP, and she's getting better outcomes in flexion at the DIP. And so that should also be interesting to us is where we initiate the motion may be where we see our best outcomes for motion. And for her study, she actually found more excellent and good results in those clients that she used the short splint with. So this should rock the house a little bit. This should change things. This should get people thinking um, and getting people out of those Duran and Hauser and Kleinert protocols into at least a more progressive wrist neutral, like Stephanie was saying, or wrist extended position that will give us better outcomes um, for these patients. So we know we want to move. And we know we want our motion to actually influence how we choose to make the splint. And so we don't want the splint to dictate our motion. We actually want our motion to help us identify what splint we want to make. So then how do we move forward? This is probably the most important part. How do we achieve and maintain that tendon glide over time? So my hope is that with Dr. Borst, you're doing a lot of talking about how our evaluations should inform our interventions, and that sh this should be a cycle. So we evaluate our clients. We identify the problems they have. Based on those problems, we set goals, and then we create interventions. This is all a cycle. And then the next question is, is what we're doing actually working? And we do that by reevaluating. And so it's kind of a constant cycle to see if what we're doing is actually working. And so our intervention should be directly tied to our evaluations and our goals and our interventions. So it should all continue to work in a loop. How do we do that for tendon rehab? We've got to measure. We've got to measure all the time, and we have to measure a lot. So how do we measure tendon glide? So that whole thing I've been talking about all night, those blue bubbles and the tendons pulling through the bubbles to create that flexion, how do we actually measure that? So we measure that by comparing active and passive flexion. If your doctors don't want you to do active flexion yet, place and hold can be used as a means to assess the tendon, even if you're not getting into active flexion just yet. So if your active range or your place and hold is not equal to your passive range, then something is wrong. And so this is the patient that if you take their index finger, you can very easily create flexion. You ask them to create flexion actively, they can't do it. Something is not working. Something is not right. And in the cases of flexor tendon repair, typically this is because the tendon is not gliding. And so this is how we measure tendon glide as we compare active to passive. So I'm going to show you three goniometers. Don't vote out loud, vote in your head. So this is option A, option B, option C. Let's go back to A for a second. Total number of numbers on this goniometer is five. Likelihood of error using this goniometer is off the charts. I have confiscated and thrown out every metal dorsal finger goniometer that exists in every university I've worked at. 
I do not allow students to learn goniometry using these because their reliability and validity of this tool is terrible. So the question you should have is, how, how many guesses am I making between here and here? And how easy would it be for me to get it wrong? Now, when I say this, usually therapists get really mad at me, and they're like, but I love that goniometer. It's so easy to use. And I said, yes, but if we don't have good data, we aren't actually going to know whether our tendons are gliding. So now let's look at this option. All right, we've got more numbers now. But I still have 15 degree ranges where there are no numbers. So again, I may be estimating. The other thing I don't allow students to do is, is round. So we do not teach students to round to five. Um, so if you are at 40 or 45 and you're between that, you should be telling me it's 41, 42, 43, or 44, not rounding up to 45 or down to 40. Now, best case scenario is the 360. At Hand Center in St. Louis, we hacked the arms off these things, so we literally would cut them here, put moleskin over it, and we use these for every goniometric measurement of every joint of the upper extremity, including the DIP, using a lateral approach. If you're at all curious about that, um, my mentor and I published two articles in the late 90s about lateral versus dorsal placement using a 360 in journal hand therapy. Um, but basically what you want to think about is how many tick marks are there and how likely am I to be intra-rater reliable? So how likely is it that I measure the same way over time? And inter-rater. So if Patty sees my patient tomorrow, is she going to measure the same way I do? And these are really important ideas to think about, especially when we're trying to measure tendon gliding. If I see a patient two to three times a week, how often do I measure? Every single time. For flexor tendon, every single time. No matter what, passive and active, every single time. So what do I do with the numbers? Two, op Three options. Okay, so I've got my passive range of motion measurements and my active range of motion measurements. So I've got a few different options for what to do with those numbers. Number one is I can use total active motion. Probably most of you use these numbers. And so this was um, suggested in 1983 and basically is an equation that includes MP, PIP, and DIP flexion, subtracting any extensor lag at any of those joints to give us this total active motion number. And typically people use 275 to 280 as that kind of goal for total active motion. Back in 1983, that total active motion was compared to the normal side using these percentages to tell you if you had excellent results, good, fair, poor, or worse, which hopefully nobody's worse than before surgery. So what about something more specific? So you know from last week that the MP motion is really primarily afforded to us by the intrinsics, including the lumbricals and interosteae. So those aren't long flexors, and those weren't repaired. So let's take those out of the equation. So this equation is active PIP and DIP flexion minus any extensor lags at the PIP or DIP divided by 175, which again is a normative, is a normative um, value. Fiona Peck, who did that short splint, she says, don't put 175 down there. Go to the other hand, measure PIP and DIP flexion, measure that person's normal, so that you really get an accurate percentage of how well this person is doing. So I'm going to put their active PIP and DIP in this equation, take away any extensor legs, divide it by 175 or their norm, and multiply by 100 to get their percent of normal. So for every client I see, I've got all their measurements written down, I've got their total active motion, and then I've got their Strickland's percentage is what we call this, so I can see what their percent of normal is. And using Strickland's percentage, I can get to these numbers. And this is the original um, grading system. Now, some people think that they're supposed to use these at the end of treatment. So I only use Strickland's percentage at the end or when it's over. I actually use these every single time I measure, because it gives me a really nice little number to look at to see what percent and if that percent is increasing or decreasing. You've got one more option that uh, therapists typically like the least because this is probably the hardest to wrap your head around. Um, and this actually just looks at one single tendon and change between therapy sessions. So these are called change scores. So this 
score indicates whether the tendon is responsive or unresponsive to your intervention. So we're going to use the FDP for this example. You're going to take today's DIP flexion, just DIP flexion, so just that one number, subtract yesterday's or two days ago's, divide it by two days ago, and multiply by 100. And that's the percent of change between your therapy sessions. This is based on Gale Growth's Pyramid article from 2004. And so basically what Gale said is, you don't probably have any adhesions if you only have a five degree or less discrepancy between active and passive range. And I would definitely agree with that. If your tendon changes by 10 or more degrees between therapy sessions, your tendon is responding to your treatment. But if you have less than 10%, your therapy is unresponsive or not responding to your treatment. And so this is all very interesting because this, what this is telling you is I measure every time and I use those measurements to tell me whether my tendon gliding is getting better or not getting better. And then I'm going to base my subsequent interventions on whether that tendon is changing or not. So how does that work? It's kind of backwards, or some people think it's backwards. If my numbers are changing and the tendon is getting better, I do nothing. So if the tendon gliding is good, I'm on the bottom, I protect the tendon from resistance and potential rupture for a longer period of time. So if I start my patient on, let's just say we're using the Don Lalonde mid-range active motion, and I measure, and they're doing mid-range active motion, and they come back in two days, and they're getting better, they've improved, I'm going to sit mid-range active flexion. And usually I tell my patients, I hope that this is the most boring experience of your life, because if this exercise works, we're going to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Now let's just say, Sandy, if I see your question, um, let's just say that they're not getting better. Then I'm going to add more things or do more things. And so we only add more interventions if the patient's actually not getting better. And so some therapists say to me, well, what are you doing for eight weeks? What are you doing for six weeks? And I say, my goal is to do the same thing for six weeks, is that they're doing so well and I started them soon enough that I don't have to add a bunch of extra things to them. I'm going to go back here for one second because Sandeep has a really good question. Sandeep, yes, this example here is for FDP. You could plug in your PIP if you're working on FDS, or you could do both of these equations if you have somebody that has both FDS and FDP. So this is a lot of math. So if you don't like math, you're going, I don't want to do all this. But yeah, you can use change scores for either or both. You would just use a separate equation for each of the tendons. So we got all these scoring. If my patient's getting better, I'm going to hold the phone. If my patient's not getting better, that's when I'm going to protect, progress my treatment. But the question is, how do I do it? How do I do it safely? What, how do I know? How would I know? Dr. Boyer, I worked with him for many years in St. Louis, he wrote an article and he was super mad about this whole pyramid thing. He's like, this is craziness. He's like, you shouldn't be progressing people just because. And so he doesn't believe that necessarily you need to keep adding exercises to add or increase strength, which we agree with. If we know the forces of these exercises, it's going to help us to move these patients forward very, very carefully. So it's going to tell us what to do, but also what not to do. So this is an old visual, and it's been used for many, many years, and it's so horrible that I hate to show it to you, but let me show it to you anyway. So um, if I look, what I have here is this red line is a two-strand tendon repair. The yellow line is a four-strand repair, and the green line is a six-strand repair. And so what you see is that the repair time at the one-week point, all repairs are considered to get softer and weaker. That's really outside the scope of tonight's discussion, um, but this is something we could probably argue about. At three weeks, it gets stronger, and at six weeks, it's stronger than when it was originally repaired. Now, back in 75 and 1993, basically, there were three terms used for what we as therapists do for exercises. This makes me crazy. This light blue down here is passive motion. What you see is that the, and that's that passive protected extension that I showed you where you mobilize the PIP and DIP. What you see is that that exercise is way below the lowest force that this can withstand. So this is really a safe exercise at all times for all repairs. 
But here's this blue one, and this says light active. I don't know what light active therapy is. I don't know how you define that. I don't know how we would tell our patients to do light active therapy. I mean, that's kind of a crappy term. Up at the top is this idea of a strong grasp. And what you see here is that this is too much for even the six strand repair. So my question was, okay, this is not very specific information, and I've got much better information that I can share than these crappy terms. So what I did was I used these repair strengths um, that were established by Strickland in 1993 and plotted them against the exercises that we can use as therapists. So what I want you to keep your eye on here is that at one week, the weakest point of a two-strain repair is 1,250 grams. That's going to be an important number to keep in mind. Four-strain is much higher, it's 2,150, but this is what to keep in mind here, 1,250. One point that I have to make is that if you have the chance to see a patient with a flexor tendon repair, you must find out how many strands the repair is. You have to ask the surgeon or the resident or the fellow, or whoever did the repair, how many strands are crossing the repair site. Because if you don't have that information, you have nothing. So you really, really, really need to know that information. So let's look at our exercises. And you're going to see I added wrist in here. Remember that 1250 number as we go forward. So everybody take a minute and flex your wrist. So you know that your digital flexors, you know this, can flex your wrist and are actually really good wrist flexors. But when they create wrist flexion, it only takes them about 300 grams of force. So active wrist flexion is actually quite safe to do in the early postoperative phase. What about active wrist extension? So, Stephanie, this goes back to your question. So, during active wrist extension, are there actually forces on the flexor tendon? And even though during digital flexion extension there were, Schwind et al. actually suggested that active wrist extension does put some forces on the flexor tendon, about 400 grams, actually, still well below that 1250. Here's that Durand's exercise again, and here it is in a different picture where I'm mobilizing the DIP from flexion to extension and the PIP from flexion to extension. And if you look at this number, it's super low. So passive protected digital extension only creates about 200 to 300 grams of force on the healing tendon and it creates distal glide. Keep that in mind for later, but think about this exercise creating glide in a distal direction. Here's your place and hold. This is what I was trying to tell you or walk you through before, but basically what's happening here is you're placing and holding the, fit, the fist until you get into an extended position, and then you're letting the patient create wrist flexion with digit extension. If you do this in a place and hold way, so they don't create the fist themselves, you create it for them, it actually only creates about 900 grams of force on the flexor tendon. Active straight fist. Now watch our numbers. They're getting up there now. Active straight fist. So everybody give this a shot. Active straight fist from extension to flexion is about 1,100 grams of force, primarily on the FDS tendon. Karen Stewart Pettengill, who actually gave the Natalie Barr lecture at ACHT, she would say that patients don't understand this exercise. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I would say that I have had many patients that understand and can very easily complete this exercise. Active hook fist. Now here's your FDS and FDP, really good, you know, you're getting good motion of both of those. Differential gliding, 1,300 grams though. So for that patient with the two strain repair, I should be nervous about this exercise in the early phase. And so we're really thinking about if I'm progressing exercises, how much is too much? This could be too much, and I'll show you that in just a second. And then active composite fist. Look at this crazy thing. 400 to 4,000 grams of force. Now let's think about this for a second. 400 to 4,000 grams. This is where I usually say to people, and look at all this literature to support these numbers. If I tell a patient, make a fist, the first thing that comes to my mind is punching someone. And so I'm going to grip really hard and really tight. What we're seeing in these new protocols is nobody's going towards full active flexion anymore. We're seeing a third of the range, mid-range, available range, initiating with the DIP, but we're not seeing people coming into a full, angry, composite fist anymore. So this exercise has really become a thing of the past when it comes to flexor tendon rehab because people don't want to engage into that full, composite, flexed position.
isolated PIP flexion, so actually just flexing one joint at a time, about 900 grams of force. These are on the, um, measured on the FDP tendon. The other thing I want you to show you about this picture is that in the old pictures, you would see this, where the fingers were holding against the flexor tendon. Karin Stewart and Patrick, Pat, blah, Karin Stewart, Pettengill also gave great suggestion that you should hold the sides of the finger, not hold over the flexor tendon. I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought, yeah, that's a pretty good point. We should be holding the sides of the digit as opposed to pushing on those flexor tendons while they're doing the exercise. Isolated DIP flexion, 1,900 grams of force. You're really getting a lot of force out there at the most distal end of the motion. And so when we use those specific terms, now I want you to look at how that graphic has changed dramatically. Now, for that two-strand repair, we actually have three exercises that fall underneath it. So that would be safe to progress to in the early phase. So you started with your protocol motions, or you started with the motions you wanted to start with. You measured. You noticed that your tendon was not gliding or not responsive. And now you know, hey, I can move on to these three exercises safely before the three-week time point. And so this helps give you information about what's actually safe to do with your clients. So this is just different information. So we had all these exercises. What we know now is, the composite fist is kind of a thing of the past. Nobody's really doing this anymore, nor suggesting that we do it anymore. What we're seeing is people are really looking at a gentle fist, a half fist, a partial fist, with the wrist in an extended position. That creates proximal glide of the flexor tendons. And people are holding on to those Durand's exercises because they create distal glide of the flexor tendons. So those orange circles show you the exercises that people are typically starting with. So starting with Durant's passive, get those joints ready, get everything moving, move on to a gentle fist, a partial fist with the wrist in an extended position, and then start measuring. And based on your measurements, then decide how to move forward. Skip that one. So this table, um, and I'm going to send you the PDF of this whole PowerPoint just so you can go through it and ask questions later if you want to. This table actually gives you all of those exercises the amount of excursion the exercises produce, what direction the excursion occurs in, and the forces that are produced using that exercise. So this is a really nice table that can help you make good decisions. And then there's two modified pyramids. And so this pyramid is really for the two-strand repair. So if you look over here, it actually shows you what exercises are safe in the first 20 days, the first 41 days, six weeks, and then after the six-week point. And then the same kind of a pyramid for the four-strand repair, but you'll notice you've got a lot more green light in those first 21 days because you have more strands or more strength crossing the repair site. And so these are all the exercises that I just showed you, um, but it just tells you when it's safe to do that or how soon it would be safe to progress to those. So what are some of the messages? What are the big take-home points? And then we've got some time for questions. Um, the first one is that, we want to initiate therapy early. Um, optimal day is day five, um, but certainly there's literature that supports anything between three and seven. We want to start that therapy with slow and controlled motion in response to swelling. So you do want to monitor swelling. You don't want to shut down your exercises, but you want to use them cautiously and maybe modulate or change them a little bit. Certainly need to monitor the use of Coban or Adherent Wrap during exercise. You've really got to tell the patients to take that stuff off while they're exercising so you don't create more force than you want to. You really want to move that wrist early. Um, you want to maximally glide the tendons and offset those antagonistics or those passive forces from those extensors. So you want to choose a splint or a cast that allows safe early wrist motion or positioning. Stephanie made a great point. If your doctor doesn't like the idea of wrist in extended position, start with wrist in neutral. Um, if that surgeon is okay with putting the wrist in extended position, Try to talk them into a partial active range. There's great protocols out there, and I can share a lot of these articles with you because you're my students and you have access to them. And so we can really look at a lot of these articles next semester, too, and think about kind of what rationale we have to start these pro protocols. And then finally, you've got to measure. And you've got to measure often, and you've got to really look closely at your measurements and really analyze them with these formulas to try to figure out um, 
when you should move forward because you really do want to see if that tendon is gliding. If you're getting increased gliding over time, there is no reason to subject the tendon to more force than you need to. Um, and so we know forces come from those antagonists, we know forces come from wrist position, but we also know that forces come from our exercises. And so if we put too much force on those tendons, um, we certainly can have a worse result. And so you really want to balance all your pieces, like that balance slide that I showed you at the very beginning. And Steph, I'll give you the whole reference list, actually. I've got a whole huge flexor tendon reference list that I'll send to you guys with, the, um, with this talk, a PDF of this talk. So with that, um, that is the end of this talk, and so now anybody who wants to stay on